Hello, welcome to Enkido Stories channel. I hope you are all good. Please, don't forget to like the video if you like it. And subscribe. Let's begin. A Short Guide to the City by Peter Straub The Viaduct Killer named for the location where his victims' bodies have been discovered, is still at large. There have been six victims to date, found by children, people exercising their dogs, lovers, or, in one instance, by policemen. The bodies lay sprawled, their throats slashed, partially sheltered by one or another of the massive concrete supports at the top of the slope beneath the Great Bridge. We assume that the viaduct killer is a resident of the city, a voter, a renter, or property owner, a product of the city's excellent public school system, perhaps even a parent of children who even now attend one of its seven elementary schools, three public high schools, two parochial schools, or single non-denominational private school. He may own a boat or belong to the Book of the Month Club. He may frequent one or another of its many bars and taverns. He may have subscription tickets to the concert series put on by the City Symphony Orchestra. He may be a factory worker with a library ticket. He owns a car, perhaps two. He may swim in one of the city's public pools or the vast lake, punctuated with sailboats, during the hot moist August of the city. For this is a Midwestern city, northern, with violent changes of season. The extremes of climate, from 10 or 20 below zero to up around 100 in the summer, cultivate an attitude of acceptance in its citizens, of insularity, it looks inward, not out, and few of its children leave for the more temperate, uncertain, and experimental cities of the eastern or western coasts. The city is proud of its modesty, it cherishes the ordinary, or what it sees as the ordinary, which is not. It has had the same mayor for 24 years, a man of limited to average intelligence who has aged gracefully and has never had any other occupation of any sort. Ambition, the yearning for fame, position, and achievement is discouraged here. One of its citizens became the head of a small foreign state, another a famous band leader, yet another a Hollywood staple who for decades played the part of the star's best friend and confidant. This, it is felt, is enough, and besides, all of these people are now dead. The city has no literary tradition. Its only mirror is provided by its two newspapers, which have thick sports sections and are comfortable enough to be read in bed. The city's characteristic mode is denial. For this reason, an odd fabulousness permeates every quarter of the city, a receptiveness to fable, to the unrecorded. A river runs through the center of the business district, as the Liffey runs through Dublin, the Seine through Paris, the Thames through London, and the Danube through Budapest, though our river is smaller and less consequential than any of these. Our lives are ordinary and exemplary, the citizens would say. We take part in the life of the nation, history courses through us for all our immunity to the national illnesses, it is even possible that in our ordinary lives. We too have had our pulse taken by the great national seers and opinion makers, for in us you may find. Forty years ago, in winter, the body of a woman was found on the banks of the river. She had been raped and murdered, cast out of the human community, a prostitute, never identified, and the noises of struggle that must have accompanied her death went unnoticed by the patrons of the Green Woman Taproom, located directly above that point on the river where her body was discovered. It was an abnormally cold winter that year, a winter of shared misery, and within the Green Woman the music was loud, feverish, festive. 
In that community, which is Irish and lives above its riverfront shops and bars, neighborhood children were supposed to have found a wingman huddling in a packing case, an aged man, half-starved, speaking a strange language none of the children knew. His wings were ragged and dirty, many of the feathers as cracked and threadbare as those of an old pigeon's, and his feet were dirty and swollen. Yule Lee Gak The children screamed at him, mocking the sounds that came from his mouth. They pelted him with rocks and snowballs, imagining that he had crawled up from that same river which sent chill damp, a damp as cold as cancer, into their bones and bedrooms, which gave them earaches and chillblains, which in summer bred rats and mosquitoes. One of the city's newspapers is Democratic, the other Republican. Both papers ritually endorse the mayor, who though consummately political has no recognizable politics. Both of the city's newspapers also support the chief of police, crediting him with keeping the city free of the kind of violence that has undermined so many other American cities. None of our citizens goes armed, and our church attendance is still far above the national average. We are ambivalent about violence. We have very few public statues, mostly of Civil War generals. On the lakefront, separated from the rest of the town by a six-lane expressway, stands the cube-like structure of the Art Center, otherwise called the War Memorial. Its rooms are hung with mediocre paintings before which schoolchildren are led on tours by their teachers, most of whom were educated in our local school system. Our teachers are satisfied, decent people, and the statistics about alcohol and drug abuse among both students and teachers are very encouraging. There is no need to linger at the War Memorial. Proceeding directly north, you soon find yourself among the orderly, impressive precincts of the wealthy. It was in this sector of the town, known generally as the East Side, that the brewers and tanners who made our city's first great fortunes set up their mansions. Their houses have a northern, Germanic, even Baltic look which is entirely appropriate to our climate. Of gray stone or red brick, the size of factories or prisons, these stately buildings seem to conceal that vein of fantasy that is actually our most crucial inheritance. But it may be that the style of life, the invisible, hidden life, of these inbred merchants is itself fantastic, the multitude of servants, the maids and coachmen, the cooks and laundresses, the private zoos, the elaborate dynastic marriages and fleets of cars, the rooms lined with silk wallpaper, the twenty-course meals, the underground wine cellars and bomb shelters. Of course we do not know if all of these things are true, or even if some of them are true. Our society folk keep to themselves, and what we know of them we learn chiefly from the newspapers, where they are pictured at their balls, standing with their beautiful daughters before fountains of champagne. The private zoos have been broken up long ago. As citizens, we are free to walk down the avenues, past the magnificent houses, and to peer in through the gates at their coach houses and lawns. A uniformed man polishes a car for tall young people in white play tennis on a private court. The viaduct killer's victims have all been adult women. While you continue moving north, you will find that as the houses diminish in size, the distance between them grows greater. Through the houses, now without gates and coach houses, you can glimpse a sheet of flat grayish blue, the lake. The air is free, you breathe it in. That is freedom, breathing this air from the lake. Free people may invent themselves in any image, and you may imagine yourself a prince of the earth, walking with an easy stride. Your table is set with linen, china, crystal, and silver, and as you dine, 
as the servants pass among you with the serving trays, the talk is educated, enlightened, without prejudice of any sort. The table talk is mainly about ideas, it is true, ideas of a conservative caste. You deplore violence, you do not recognize it. Further north lie suburbs, which are uninteresting. If from the war memorial you proceed south, you cross the viaduct. Beneath you is a valley. The valley is perhaps best seen in the dead of winter. All of our city welcomes winter, for our public buildings are gray stone fortresses which, on days when the temperature dips below zero and the old gray snow of previous storms swirls in the avenues, seem to blend with the leaden air and become dreamlike and cloudy. This is how they were meant to be seen. The valley is called, it is called the valley. Red flames tilt and waver at the tops of columns, and smoke pours from factory chimneys. The trees seem to be black. In the winter, the smoke from the factories becomes solid, like dark gray glaciers, and hangs in the dark air in defiance of gravity, like wings that are a light feathery gray at their tips and darken imperceptibly toward black, toward pitchy black at the point where these great frozen glaciers, these dirigibles, would join the body at the shoulder. The bodies of the great birds to which these wings are attached must be imagined. In the old days of the city, the time of the private zoos, wolves were bred in the valley. Wolves were in great demand in those days. Now the wolf ranches have been entirely replaced by factories, by rough taverns owned by retired shop foremen, by spurs of the local railroad line, and by narrow streets lined with rickety frame houses and sure repair shops. Most of the old wolf breeders were Polish, and though their kennels, grassy yards, and barbed wire exercise runs have disappeared, at least one memory of their existence endures, the valley's street signs are in the Polish language. Tourists are advised to skirt the valley, and it is always recommended that photographs be confined to the interesting views obtained by looking down from the viaduct. The more courageous visitors, those in search of pungent experience, are cautiously directed to the taverns of the ex-foreman, in particular the oldest of these, the rusty nail and the brace-in bit, where the wooden floors have so softened and furred with lavings and scrubbings that the boards have come to resemble the pelts of long, narrow, short-haired animals. For the intrepid, these words of caution, do not dress conspicuously, and carry only small amounts of cash. Some working knowledge of Polish is also advised. Continuing further south, we come to the Polish district proper, which also houses pockets of Estonians and Lithuanians. More than the city's sadly declining downtown area, this district has traditionally been regarded as the city's heart and has remained unchanged for more than a hundred years. Here the visitor may wander freely among the markets and street fairs, delighting in the sight of well-bundled children rolling hoops, patriarchs in tall fur hats and long beards, and women gathering around the numerous communal water pumps. The sausages and stuffed cabbage sold at the food stalls may be eaten with impunity, and the local beer is said to be of an unrivaled purity. Violence in this district is invariably domestic, and the visitor may feel free to enter the frequent political discussions, which in any case partake of a nostalgic character. In late January or early February, the South Side is at its best, with the younger people dressed in multilayered heavy woolen garments decorated with the reindeer or snowflake motif, and the older women of the community seemingly vying to see which of them can outdo the others in the thickness, blackness, and heaviness of her outer garments and in the severity of the traditional head scarf known as the babushka. 
In late winter the neatness and orderliness of these colorful folk may be seen at its best, for the wandering visitor will often see the bearded paterfamilias sweeping and shoveling not only his immaculate bit of sidewalk, for these houses are as close together as those of the wealthy along the lakefront, so near to one another that until very recently telephone service was regarded as an irrelevance. But his tiny front lawn as well, with its Marian shrines, creches, ornamental objects such as elves, trolls, postboys, etc. It is not unknown for residents here to proffer the stranger an invitation to inspect their houses in order to display the immaculate condition of the kitchen with its well-blackened wood stove and polished ornamental tiles, and perhaps even extend a thimble glass of their own peach or plum brandy to the thirsty visitor. Alcohol, with its associations of warmth and comfort, is ubiquitous here, and it is the rare family that does not devote some portion of the summer to the preparation of that winter's plenty. For these people, violence is an internal matter, to be resolved within or exercised upon one's own body and soul or those of one's immediate family. The inhabitants of these neat, scrubbed little houses with their statues of Mary and cathedral tiles, the descendants of the hard-drinking wolf breeders of another time have long since abandoned the practice of crippling their children to ensure their continuing exposure to parental values, but self-mutilation has proved more difficult to eradicate. Few blind themselves now, but many a grandfather conceals a three-fingered hand within his embroidered mitten. Toes are another frequent target of self-punishment, and the prevalence of cheerful, even boisterous shops, always crowded with old men telling stories, which sell the hand-carved wooden legs known as pegs or dollies, speaks of yet another. No one has ever suggested that the viaduct killer is a South Side resident. The Southsiders live in a profound relationship to violence, and its effects are invariably implosive rather than explosive. Once a decade, perhaps twice a decade, one member of a family will realize, out of what depths of cultural necessity the outsider can only hope to imagine, that the whole family must die, be sacrificed, to speak with greater accuracy. Axes, knives, bludgeons, bottles, babushkas, ancient derringers, virtually every imaginable implement has been used to carry out this aim. The houses in which this act of sacrifice has taken place are immediately, if not instantly, cleaned by the entire neighborhood, acting in concert. The bodies receive a Catholic burial in consecrated ground, and a mass is said in honor of both the victims and their murderer. A picture of the departed family is installed in the church which abuts Market Square, and for years the house is kept clean and dust-free by the grandmothers of the neighborhood. Men young and old will quietly enter the house, sip the brandy of the removed, as they are called, meditate, now and then switch on the wireless or the television set, and reflect on the darkness of earthly life. The departed are frequently said to appear to friends and neighbors and often accurately predict the coming of storms and assist in the location of lost household objects, a treasured button or mother's sewing needle. After the year has elapsed, the house is sold, most often to a young couple, a young blacksmith or market vendor and his bride who find the furniture and even the clothing of the removed welcome additions to their small household. Further south are suburbs and impoverished hamlets, which do not compel a visit. Immediately west of the War Memorial is the city's downtown. Before its decline, this was the city's business district and administrative center, and the monuments of its affluence remain. Marching directly west on the wide avenue which begins at the expressway are the federal building, the post office, and the great edifice of City Hall. 
Each is an entire block long and constructed of granite blocks quarried far north in the state. Flights of marble stairs lead up to the massive doors of these structures, and crystal chandeliers can be seen through many of the windows. The facades are classical and severe, uniting in an architectural landscape of granite revetments and colonnades of pillars. Within, these grand and inhuman buildings have long ago been carved and partitioned into warrants illuminated by bare light bulbs or flickering fluorescent tubing, each tiny office with its worn counter for petitioners and a stamped sign proclaiming its function, tax and excise, dog licenses, passports, graphs and charts, registry of notary publics, and the like. The larger rooms with chandeliers which face the avenue, reserved for civic receptions and banquets, are seldom used. In the next sequence of buildings are the Hall of Records, the Police Headquarters, and the Criminal Courts Building. Again, wide empty marble steps lead up to massive bronze doors, rows of columns, glittering windows which on wintry days reflect back the gray empty sky. Local craftsmen, many of them descendants of the city's original French settlers, forged and installed the decorative iron bars and grills on the facade of the criminal courts building. After we pass the massive, nearly windowless brick facades of the gas and electric buildings, we reach the arching metal drawbridge over the river. Looking down river, we can see its muddy banks and the lights of the terrace of the Green Woman Taproom, now a popular gathering place for the city's civil servants. A few feet further east is the spot from which a disgruntled lunatic attempted and failed to assassinate President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Further on stand the high cement walls of several breweries. The drawbridge has not been raised since 1956, when a corporate yacht passed through. Beyond the drawbridge lies the old mercantile center of the city, with its adult bookstores, pornographic theaters, coffee shops, and its rank of old department stores. These now house discount outlets selling roofing tiles, mufflers and other auto parts, plumbing equipment, and cut-rate clothing, and most of their display windows have been boarded or bricked in since the civic disturbances of 1968. Various civic plans have failed to revive this area, though the cobblestones and gas street lamps installed in the optimistic mid-70s can for the most part still be seen. Connoisseurs of the poignant will wish to take a moment to appreciate them, though they should seek to avoid the bands of ragged children that frequent this area at nightfall, for though these children are harmless they can become pressing in their pleas for small change. Many of these children inhabit dwellings they have constructed themselves in the vacant lots between the adult bookstores and fast food outlets of the old mercantile district, and the tree houses atop mounds of tires, most of them several stories high and utilizing fire escapes and flights of stairs scavenged from the old department stores, are of some architectural interest. The strangers should not attempt to penetrate these children's cities, and on no account should offer them any more than the pocket change they request or display a camera, jewelry, or an expensive wristwatch. The truly intrepid tourist seeking excitement may hire one of these children to guide him to the diversions of his choice. Two dollars is the usual gratuity for this service. It is not advisable to purchase any of the goods the children themselves may offer for sale, although they have been affected by the same self-consciousness evident in the impressive buildings on the other side of the river and do sell picture postcards of their largest and most eccentric constructions. It may be that the naive architecture of these tree houses represents the city's most authentic artistic expression, and the postcards, amateurish as most of them are, provide interesting, perhaps even valuable, documentation of this expression of what may be called folk art.
These industrious children of the mercantile area have ritualized their violence into highly formalized tattooing and spontaneous forays and raids into the tree houses of opposing tribes during which only superficial injuries are sustained, and it is not suspected that the viaduct killer comes from their number. Further west are the remains of the city's museum and library, devastated during the civic disturbances, and beyond these picturesque, still-smoking hulls lies the ghetto. It is not advised to enter the ghetto on foot, though the tourist who has arranged to rent an automobile may safely drive through it after he has negotiated his toll at the gatehouse. The ghetto's residents are completely self-sustaining, and the attentive tourist who visits this district will observe the multitude of tents housing hospitals, wholesale food and drug warehouses, and the like. Within the ghetto are believed to be many fine poets, painters, and musicians, as well as the historians known as memorists, who are the district's living encyclopedias and archivists. The memorist's tasks include the memorization of the works of the area's poets, painters, etc., for the district contains no printing presses or art supply shops, and these inventive and self-reliant people have devised this method of preserving their works. It is not believed that a people capable of inventing the genre of oral painting could have spawned the viaduct killer, and in any case no ghetto resident is permitted access to any other area of the city. The ghetto's relationship to violence is unknown. Further west the annual snowfall increases greatly, for seven months of the year dropping an average of 2.3 feet of snow each month upon the shopping malls and paper mills which have concentrated here. Dust storms are common during the summers, and certain infectious viruses, to which the inhabitants have become immune, are carried in the water. Still further west lies the sports complex. The tourist who has ventured thus far is well advised to turn back at this point and return to our beginning, the War Memorial. Your car may be left in the ample and clearly posted parking lot on the memorial's eastern side. From the memorial's wide empty terraces, you are invited to look southeast, where a great unfinished bridge crosses half the span to the hamlets of Wyatt and Arnoldville. Construction was abandoned on this noble civic project, subsequently imitated by many cities in our western states and in Australia and Finland, immediately after the disturbances of 1968, when its lack of utility became apparent. When it was noticed that many families chose to eat their bag lunches on the memorial's lakeside terraces in order to gaze silently at its great interrupted arc, the bridge was adopted as the symbol of the city, and its image decorates the city's many flags and medals. The broken span, as it is called, which hangs in the air like the great frozen wings above the valley, serves no function but the symbolic. In itself and entirely by accident, this great non-span memorializes violence, not only by serving as a reference to the workmen who lost their lives during its construction, its non-construction. It is not rounded or finished in any way, for labor on the bridge ended abruptly, even brutally, and from its truncated floating end dangle lengths of rusting iron webbing, thick wire cables weighted by chunks of cement and bits of old planking material. In the days before access to the unbridge was walled off by an electrified fence, two or three citizens each year elected to commit their suicides by leaping from the end of the span, and one must resort to a certain lexical violence when referring to it. Ghetto residents are said to have named it Whitey, and the treehouse children call it Ursula, after one of their own killed in the disturbances. Southsiders refer to it as the ghost, civil servants, the beast, and Eastsiders simply as that thing. The broken span has the violence of all unfinished things, of everything interrupted or left undone. 
In violence, there is often the quality of yearning, the yearning for completion, foreclosure, for that which is absent and would if present bring to fulfillment, for the body without which the wing is a useless frozen ornament. It ought not to go unmentioned that most of the city's residents have never seen the bridge except in its representations, and for this majority the bridge is little more or less than a myth, being without any actual referent. It is pure idea. Violence, it is felt though unspoken, is the physical form of sensitivity. The city believes this. In completion, the lack of referent which strands you in the realm of pure idea demands release from itself. We are above all an American city, and what we believe most deeply we the victims of the viaduct killer, that citizen who excites our attention, who makes us breathless with outrage and causes our police force to ransack the humble dwellings along the riverbank, have all been adult women. These women in their middle years are taken from their lives and set like statues beside the pillar. Each morning there is more pedestrian traffic on the viaduct, and the frozen morning's men mainly men, come with their lunches in paper bags, walking slowly along the cement walkway, not looking at one another, barely knowing what they are doing, looking down over the edge of the viaduct, looking away, dawdling, finally leaning like fishermen against the railing, waiting until they can no longer delay going to their jobs. The visitor who has done so much and gone so far in this city may turn his back on the broken span, the focus of civic pride, and look in a southwesterly direction past the six lanes of the expressway, perhaps on tiptoe, children may have to mount one of the convenient retaining walls. The dull flanks of the viaduct should just now be visible, with the heads and shoulders of the waiting men picked out in the gray air like brush strokes. The quality of their yearning, its expectancy, is visible even from here. 